that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell, the famous Tom Fennell, <laughs> philanthropist, <laughs> hey, good guy. Proper hand this time. Yeah, and me, of course. Not that I'm a philanthropist or a good guy. Um, this is news on energy and climate change, which is um, put together daily and uh, collated weekly and presented to you as uh, news as for gospel truth. As gospel <laughs> truth. <laughs> Yes, and uh, we this this week uh, we start on Thursday, June eighteenth, and we run up to Wednesday, uh, June twenty fourth, and so we will start with an item from the National Catholic Reporter. Pope Francis has clearly embraced what he calls quote a very solid scientific consensus end quote that humans are causing cataclysmic climate change, and that is and uh, endangering the planet. The Pope also lambasted global political leaders for their, quote, weak responses, end quote, and the lack of will over decades to address the issue. And this, this is pretty heavy stuff. It's pretty heavy stuff, yeah. The, it's interesting the, to see some of the congressional Catholics square. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, it is, isn't it? What is that picture, Tom? That is the Columbia River. It was part of this article, and I guess it's just shown to indicate what nature is. That's nature? Really? Well, there Oof. is a highway in the lower left corner, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's a pretty, pretty nice part of the Columbia River. It is. It's beautiful. Looking at it, there's parts of the Hudson River that look just like that. Down yes. Around, down around Storm King. And, yeah. 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 Just like that. Is Bear that Mountain. Bear Mountain? I was yeah. going to say Bear yeah. Mountain. That's, it's quite fun to drive through there. Um, anyway, that was from the National Catholic Observ a Reporter, and I think we're going to have more about the Pope. Well, we will. I'm just looking quickly. Was there anything more to talk about this now, or we'll wait till later? Let's talk, uh, talk about it later. More about okay. the Pope later. Yeah. Okay, from Mashable, a team of scientists working on studies on microbiology at Columbia University have devised tiny engines powered by evaporation. The devices generate electricity from energy produced by bacterial spores known as Bacillus subtilis. That sounds like a name of a rap singer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe somebody who watches the show will adapt it. Maybe. It's Isn't yours, it ladies and gentlemen. A little, little device that they made yeah. that's powered by evaporation. Right. This was uh, exhibit, they exhibit strong mechanical responses to changing relative humidity. The spores in this particular case can, can sit there for 20, 30 years before, they, op before they, they break open and the bacterium comes out. But the, the, they, absor they ab absorb water and swell. And when, they, when the water evaporates, they shrink again. That's just what it says here. Yeah, the spores expand when they absorb water. They contract when they dry out. And so, by controlling the, the moisture in the air produced by evaporation, the devices grab the energy from these expansions and contractions to drive rotary or piston engines. Now, this is a prototype, obviously. Yeah, even it, a sub-prototype. You know? it, it's going to be a, a toy. It's going to be a while before this is used to drive your well, car. In fact, it'll probably never be used to drive your car. It may never be. No, but if, but if can, this thing works, <coughs> there's an inexhaustible supply of evaporation. That's true. Another thing, too, <coughs> is that this thing can work at, a, at an extremely small, uh, for extremely small devices. So you could actually, you know, they don't say this in the article, as I recall, but you could, you could build um, mechanisms to power extremely small devices. Uh, I don't think devices. they mention that in the article. Yeah, I guess you could. <coughs> I mean, yeah. Bacilli are noted for their smallness. Their smallness, <laughs> yes. You know, it's interesting, um, just to give you an idea of how small they are, the human body has, I forget what the number of cells is, but bacteria cells are so small that they're, they're, they're you can look at a, at a human cell and see 
see things yeah. in it in a microscope. Yeah. When you see a, a bacteria cell next to it, it looks like it it looks like a dot. You don't see any details in that cell, whatever. You, That's you, you yeah. even in the in the most powerful optical uh, microscopes, you bar barely no, get no, anything. Are the cells small? <coughs> and the are small. They are tiny compared to other cells, and um, the average human being I have read has approximately ten times as many bacteria cells in him than he has cells of his own. <laughs> I was. <coughs> Well, I was catching up this morning. I had the radio on. Had uh, well, WBEW, I guess. Yeah. It was, and, and somebody was talking on it, and they were talking. They they were saying, "There's so many bacteria in my body. I'm starting to refer to myself in the plural. <laughs> I am now yeah. we. <laughs> we, of course. That's how editors get there yeah. by having lots of bacteria, most of which, by the way, live in your intestines. Um, and, and they're supposed to be there. You'd be in serious trouble if you didn't oh, have yeah. them. Oh, wow. Absolutely. I don't know how long you'd la last without them, but it wouldn't be very long. Okay, the next item is from Clean Technica. Denmark has launched a new tender round for 350 megawatts of nearshore wind farms off the east coast of Jutland. Jutland. Aha. Or, as you say it in English, Jutland. The turbines ha must be a minimum of 7 megawatts which would provide... That's the high end of what we're making these days. It's toward the high end, sure. Yeah. And it, but this is the thing that gets me. They have a capacity factor of 60%. And that, that's comparable to, some, to a lot of things that people talk of as baseload power. Well, yeah. I think in the North Sea, the wind blows pretty near all the time. <laughs> pretty much all the time. And um, this produces low-cost electricity. In, in contrast... And the, the article contrasts this to what would come from the Hinkley C nuclear power plant. Um, the cost of this electricity is about 50% of the cost from Hinkley C. Well, I don't think Hinkley's ever going to get built. I don't think it will be, no. I mean, the investors are walking away. The, the uh, French are out of it now, I think, and now the Chinese are getting in. Uh, the Chinese... The English it, haven't even wanted to look at it. Yes. <laughs> So what the what the government of of Britain is doing is they're they're um, basically saying that in a year they're going to stop f uh, supporting onshore wind farms, yeah, and they're still about, pushing well, that's, for that's the next thing. Yeah, that's the next item. And uh, so let's great. just go on to this. <laughs> the Guardian reported the UK's Conservative government, which by the way got a majority in the last election, so yeah, it's no yeah. longer a coalition, yeah. they, they no longer they have, more power. yeah they got more power, they've got a mandate and um, it is to end subsidies to onshore wind farms from the 1st of April 2016, a year earlier than they had, they had agreed to end them in, uh, under the previous government, which was a Tory liberal Democrat coalition government. There will be a grace period for projects already having planning permission, and this according to the Department of Energy and Climate Change. And um, I had hoped, you know, that they would do better than that, but they decided not to. Well, I think decided ultimately not they to. will. I mean, the Scots are already revolting about this. You know, they're saying, hey, <laughs> yeah. what you're saying applies down there, not up here. Yeah. And some of the English are turning around saying, you know, we got the right to plan our own. Uh, well, this is the thing, you know, uh, um, April Rudd, who's, the, who's the, the minister in charge of all of this stuff. She may not be as bad as uh, this paints her out to be. I think she well, is. it's hard for me to know. Yeah. I had thought, you know, when she said communities should be, uh, should be given the final say, I had hoped that what she meant was that if a community wanted a wind farm, it could have the wind farm. <coughs> as opposed to the, the situation that existed with a fellow named Pickles in, in charge of the whole thing, and he was just rejecting wind farms out of hand. Um, and he got, he got kind of called to, to task by the courts over that. Uh -huh. And um, he, uh, uh, Rudd has, has uh, had said that she wanted communities to be able to have some more determination, but what she's doing, or what the government is doing, is it's basically saying, uh, you can have the wind farm if you want it, but you have to pay for it. 
yourself, or you have to have an investor who's going to pay for it himself because we're not well, going to support we're it. We're reaching a point where that's a moot point. I think now. I think that's true, and I think that um, no, they're the 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 subsidies they're giving nuclear are just insane, absolutely insane. Well, to you and me, they're insane. They're not insane to the investors. They're I don't know about that either because you know the original the original plan for Hinkley C was that it was going to cost tw a little over $26 billion for two reactors. Mm -hmm. And those reactors were huge. They were two and a half times the size of the, of the Vermont Yankee plant each. But they went out and said, okay, let's get investors. And the investors weren't coming, so they finally got to the point where they were guaranteeing that the investors could, could sell the power for... Um, Ridiculously high price. The whole, wholesale price that they were going to sell the power for was higher than the retail price that the, was going to go to market, with the difference being guaranteed by the government. And it was about 200% of the standard wholesale price. And um, they, they still didn't get investors in the UK, so they went to Europe. They still didn't get investors in, in Europe, so they went to China. They got investors from China. The investors now are unhappy because of a whole series of things that have gone wrong. Um, the French have discovered that, they, that they're this, the reactor that they put together in Normandy has weak metal in some places, and this is not good. not good. And so that throws the whole thing into question. Um, the the co uh, cost has jumped from an initial estimated cost of 26 billion to 40 billion. And uh, basically what it comes down to is everything is going wrong with this thing. And yet the government is pushing it over onshore wind. Dr. Murphy's sitting up there on his clouds laughing. <laughs> well, I don't know what they're doing, but <laughs> there it is. Anyway, that was from uh, The Guardian, and it had nothing to do. The article wasn't really about Hinckley. It was about something else. But uh, <laughs> what was it about? Oh, yes, it was Watch about wind power. Yeah, Watch wind power. Way. Okay, Friday, June 19th, we got this from Biomass N Magazine. North Elba, New York has decided to use a small-scale anaerobic digester designed for source-separated municipal food and organic waste at a regional level. Biofirm Energy Systems. Um, Wiesmann Group will supply the system, the first of its kind in the United States, and the project ex is expected to begin this year. North Elba is Lake Placid. Lake Placid. Lake Placid. Okay. And uh, this is a picture. This is real. This, this, this one exists. I think that's an eyesore. <laughs> <laughs> and I can envision them making these things in factories and trucking them. This is storage. Well, you, you know, didn't is, we... That's what we're looking at. No, this is the biogas generator. Yeah. Didn't we hear yesterday in, that, in, the, in a committee meeting in Brattleboro that, that, or a subcommittee meeting that there was going to be a, a Vermont manufacturer of, of biomass? Uh, I don't remember hearing that, but that doesn't surprise me yeah. at all. I mean, it's an opportunity. It is an opportunity. Let's go back to that picture. That thing is an is a, uh, di uh, anaerobic digester, as I understand it. That's the, that's the unit, and it produces the biogas. It also produces a substance as a byproduct called digestate. Which, I haven't heard that one yet. Yeah, you don't hear that term much. Most people call it compost. But it's not technically compost because the, there are certain things in it that don't exist in most compost. And, but the thing that's interesting about it is having gone through the anaerobic digestion, it will finish the composting process in the soil if you put it in the soil. And so when that's that, beneficial. It, absolutely, and it has certain um, characteristics that are really nice, one of which is that it discourages various pathogens. That's good too. That's good too. <laughs> and it's because the lignin is still in it, but the lignin will decompose in the soil. The lignin comes from the wood. The lignin comes from, from actually fiber. 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 Yeah. It, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the two most common um, polymers in, in the world are, are lignin and cellulose. Okay. And I think the third is hemicellulose, which are the three big components of virtually all land-based plants. Land -based plants. Yeah. 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 And so this is, you know, this is... Uh, what makes them stand up. And what they're talking about here, basically, is, is um, food waste.
mm -hmm. municipal waste, things of that nature. Well, you would say North Elba, New York, where the heck is that? You know, what do they got for restaurants? But it's a resort area. Mm -hmm. so they, have, they probably they have, have lots, of lots of restaurants. Yep. Okay, Clean Technica, moving right along. Moving right along. Clean Technica told us the annual overview of European electric uh, market from the European Network of Transmission System Operators for Electricity. That's a mouthful. It's not only is it a mouthful, but it sounds... The European Electric Market <laughs> from the European Network Transmission System Operators for Electricity. Uh, it's somehow that's... So E-M-T-N-S-O-D-E. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, whatever. <laughs> they say that 33% of the, of the electricity produced in the EU, EU, European Union, now comes from renewables, which is 18.5% hydropower and 14.4% other renewables, mostly wind and solar. Well, there's uh, a graph up there that describes that. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. But from 2011, 2011 to 2014, uh, renewables have grown quite a bit and coal has shrunken. Nuclear has shrunken, and, uh, well, nuclear hasn't shrunk, but I'm wrong. But nuclear, has nuclear has shrunk in, uh, in Europe because of the closure of... Not according to this, this article, or this, this graph. Well, they're in the European Union, I don't know. Uh, the Germans shut down eight in nuclear Germany, shut eight down. nuclear power plants, which is a substantial amount, although all eight of them were relatively small. It was almost 50% of their plants, but it was only about... So about 25% or 30% of their electricity coming from nuclear. Well, the takeaway here is the increased share of renewables has come at the expense of fossil fuels. Yes. To quote, there is a revolution taking place. Yes, and there it is. is. And it is. Yep, and there are certain people in this world who are willing to pay huge amounts of money to make sure that it happens very slowly. <laughs> Because they don't particularly care about what happens in the future of the world because they're all over 73 years old. <laughs> <laughs> but they want to make sure that they keep their income. Okay. Uh, Clean Technica also told us the same day, which was Saturday, the California Senate passed SB 350, legislation that sets a goal of 50% electricity from renewables in the Golden State by 2030. The bill doesn't stop there, though. It also calls for doubling energy efficiency of buildings in the next 15 years and cutting petroleum use in transportation by half. Nice picture of the west coast, the west coast of California. They only got one coast. <laughs> Don't they have a coast on the California River? <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe it's dry down there. Um, yeah, uh, that is a nice picture of the west coast. So, should we move move on? Yeah, right. basically we see we we got yeah, it all. We, we've got the important. We've parts. got the important part. Saturday, next, June twentieth, from scary, from CNN. This is something, Tom. That's I mean, this isn't news. This has been around for years. Sixty-five million years ago, the dinosaurs disappeared in what's known as the Earth's fifth mass extinction. Today, a sixth mass extinction could well be underway and humans are the most likely culprit through environmental changes including deforestation, poaching, overfishing and global warming. And that picture is a picture of a bird that went extinct I think in the 20th century in in Hawaii. Pretty bird. Pretty bird, really yeah. Pretty bird, yeah. I think is what is it called a hoho? Moho? <laughs> Something. <laughs> I had it down here, but it was not a name I had ever heard before. Yeah. So it's not, it's not here. But you know, the, the takeaway here is the past five extinctions on Earth were caused by large scale natural disasters. Yeah. Asteroids the hitting the Earth, Earth or whatever. extinction isn't being caused by a freak of nature. I don't know about that. Human I mean, beings might be nature. a freak of nature. But, the you humans know. Humans not, were not the primary source of these extinctions. There should have been only nine species going extinct during the same period. And they say here about 477 vertebrate species have been lost since 1900. That's vertebrates. This is yeah. even bugs. Yeah, that's right. And I, I actually did a call some time ago to uh, various organizations to talk about this. And I talked to a naturalist at the, at the World Wildlife Fund. And they told me that they were, they were saying that between 30 and 70% of all multicellular 
uh, species could be rendered extinct during the 21st century if we don't get climate change under control. And, um, and we may be one of those species. Well, I don't know about that, but the, the thing that, you know, I said, well, what are we talking about here? Because a lot of these, you know, would be worms and bugs and stuff like that. And he said, well, one example species is moose. Moose, huh? They're worried about moose. And the reason is because the moose are being killed by, by um, predators and... Automobiles. And, <laughs> automobiles, <laughs> yeah, and, um, and uh, parasites that are moving into their territory faster than they can move their territory. So mm -hmm. the northern end of their territory is, is kind of blocked by forests and, and the ticks and so forth are moving in and they will take over the entire territory before, the, before new territory that the moose can move into is uh, opened up. In other words, and I've, I've talked to a number of people who have seen this happen. Moose are being killed be, by um, anemia that is caused by their, their blood being sucked by ticks. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Really? Yeah, in fact, I was talking to a woman who works at the co-op um, yesterday about this, and she said it had happened in her backyard. Wow. And um, this, this because of, you know, these deer ticks are tiny, but you get zillions of them. They do a job. On they will do a job. And I, the, I can't get too bent out of shape if we happen to lose the white rhino. But well, the white, white rhino, the another one that I, another one that I, that, you know, I, I talked to the people at the, at the Audubon Society. And they're upset because they say that we could lose 50% of our bird species in North America. And two of the species that they listed as being species that they're world worried about are the bald eagle and the Baltimore Oriole. Wow, two I mean, very we're, important birds. Yeah, I mean, if culturally, both of them are extremely <laughs> important. But um, what, what, what this means is we could lose a huge number of our birds, just in terms of the numbers of birds killed. I don't think I've seen it all. You don't see they, them very they often. Don't come to Vermont much. But you know, one thing that I used to see all the time, ever, almost every day in summer, and I don't, at all, I haven't seen a single one this year, is monarch butterflies. Yes. yes. And that is happening. That, by the way, is happening apparently because of Monsanto, specifically, and the and the Roundup. Yeah. stuff that they and other companies that make that same kind of thing and and um, it's killing milkweed it's killing the milkweed yeah. and the and the monarchs depend on that milkweed and the monarchs you know they they migrate yeah huge distances they huge migrate. distances yeah. but the individual butterflies don't go the whole distance they migrate a certain distance and then they find a milkweed plant d lay their eggs and die and then their their offspring continue the migration. At least that's what I've read. Interesting. And so the entire migration cycle might take three generations. But they've got to be able to find that milkweed plant. Mm -hmm. If and it ain't there, they ain't going to find it. That's right. And so the, 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 one of the most abundant um, butterfly species when I was a kid is now just absent from my life. Mm. And that's what it's going to be. It's a beautiful butterfly. It's a beautiful butterfly. We're going to have certain things left when this happens. And what will they be? Well, they will be our domestic animals, possibly. And in addition to that, they will include um, pigeons, mm -hmm. mice. You can bet mice mm -hmm. will survive. Rats will survive. Mm -hmm. I think that's as far as we need to get cockroaches, cockroaches will, will survive. survive. Absolutely. Overall. Unpleasant <laughs> spiders that can live on cockroaches will survive. House flies will survive. Let's make a list of good, <laughs> good species to survive. Okay, let's get off that. Back to the Pope. Back to the Pope. Yeah. Yes, uh, this is from The Equation, the blog of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Remember now, these are scientists talking. Wow, what a picture. I got a good picture. <laughs> Very, very human there. The Pope is an energy wonk. That's the title, mm -hmm. or the beginning of the title. The whole title includes engineers agree with his, six, his assessment. And the uh, message is the Pope's teachings are supported by the most comprehensive engineering analysis of the U.S. power grid. 
the National Renewable Energy Lab summarized nine in-depth engineering analyses, and they agree with the Pope. Aren't you pleased with the Pope? Well, the Pope is a Jesuit. The Jesuits are scholars. I mean, and he happens to be a chemist. He happens to be a chemist, yeah. yeah. And, uh, okay, so these guys who are, in, who are in Congress who say the Pope should let... Who, Science to the scientists. Yes, well, and, the scientists. and they have... They have um, they're lawyers. Law degrees, and they're disagreeing with 97% of scientists. I'm sorry. There's something wrong with this picture. I'll go with the Pope. I don't happen to be Roman Catholic, but I'll go with the Pope. Okay. Uh, from Clean Technica. According to the Carbon Brief, the EU's energy usage is at 1990 levels despite a 6% increase in population and a 45% expansion of economic output. This results from better building insulation and product energy efficiency, uptake of renewables, vehicle fuel efficiency standards, and economic changes. And that is a mouthful. I've got a couple of graphs here I will put up briefly. What do you got? We can spend all the afternoon talking about graphs. Oh, yeah. You can see the uh, greenhouse gas emissions since 1990. Yep. And they've been slowly but inexorably rising. They had a little bit of a decline for a while there. Yep. And the one on the left is the uh, adjusted gross energy consumption. I don't know what they mean by adjusted, but uh, we are consuming less energy. Yes. And this is a good thing. Yes. But uh, the fact that we're at 1990 levels, I think, is kind of impressive. Um, well, we're... If we continued where they were, they were going, we'd be in deep trouble. We, we would be in, we, we are, actually, we are in deep trouble. From the point of view of our environmental situation, we are in yeah. deep trouble. We are doing deep damage. It is going to continue. There is no way of getting around that, but we can make it go faster or slower, and we can make it be better or worse. And I vote for better. What yeah. about you? I hope so, too. <laughs> I'm not going to be here to enjoy it, but uh, I certainly... I can envision. I thought. I th aren't you a Hindu? <laughs> you could be back. Come back. You come back yeah. and enjoy yeah. it. Um, okay. Our next item comes from the Rutland Herald. The NRC has cleared the way for Intergy Nuclear to take two hundred and twenty million dollars of the six hundred and sixty million dollar Vermont Yankee decommissioning fund, to which they have never, by the way, given a dime. <laughs> The, you sound a little indignant. Here. A little indignant. <laughs> Anybody who isn't indignant about this one has got something seriously wrong in his head. They have never given a dime to this thing. But they're taking money out. But they're taking money out. Why am I not surprised? Oh man. To help pay for handling spent nuclear fuel that they created. NRC regulations prohibit such use of the funds, but the NRC is granting exemptions to nuclear power plants anyway. There's a picture of the nuclear spent fuel pool. Yes. And it's seven stories up in the air. Yes. And if it has a pinhole leak, <laughs> they need to keep. They're all going to be dry. They need to. They need to pump that water in there. And by the way, when those things go dry, they catch fire. Yeah. yeah. And when they catch fire, they make a frigging mess which includes, there's enough fuel in the spent fuel pool to shut down Boston forever. And I'm, I mean, just literally, literally yeah. that there is more fuel in the Vermont Yankee spent fuel pool than there was in all of the spent fuel pools at Fukushima Daiichi. Is that so? Yes. Wow. And, and there's, uh, I think it's about five times as much fuel as the fuel pool was originally designed to hold. And people are saying, well, what's wrong with nuclear energy? Or worse yet, we need nuclear energy to, to address climate change. Yeah. Yeah. That's like saying, <laughs> you, you got a headache, you want to address it, take some cyanide. Yeah. <laughs> really. All right. It here, works. Here's a fact for you. Let's hear the nuclear industry address this one. About 500 nuclear power plants have gone online worldwide since nuclear power started putting energy online. Okay. Of those, of those, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, which blew up, um, Fermi One, just outside of Detroit, um, SRE, which is just outside of Los Angeles, uh, Chapel Cross in Scotland, three at Fukushima, uh, Fukushima Daiichi, um, then there was 
Bohunica, uh, Yoslevska Bohunica, and two at Saint Laurent in Flint. So that's 11 nuclear reactors that melted down. Melted down. 11 out of 500. What percentage is that? Too much for me. It's 2%. 2%. <laughs> it's 2.2% .2 actually. So, so you put a nuclear power plant in your, in your village and what's the chance that it's going to melt down? Historically it has been 2.2%. That's negligible. Negligible. <laughs> and, and as long as you live somewhere else, it's negligible. Yeah, right. There is no such thing as being downwind from a nuclear power plant. If you're upwind from the nuclear power plant, you're downwind from another. And on top of everything else, they've got everything tilted in their favor. Well, this is an interesting takeaway about this, this specific case. Yes. Vermont Yankees Trust Fund is currently about $600 million. Which, yes. as you mentioned, Energy never contributed. They never contributed to it. About half of the estimate of the $1.2 billion that they're going to need to, to get the job done. Yes. Where is that going to come from? They don't even ask. They, they don't oh, it's, ask. No, it's going to come because they put the stuff into good investments. Uh -huh. the, the investments will grow. Over, they're they're well, going to do they safe store. Been, they're they're, they're going to do safe store and those investments will grow. Now, I want to point out that we cannot project the value of investments into the future. Well, what would you do if, if your, if your, if your uh, investment broker said, I guarantee you that this is going to be worth three times what it is now, only 30 years from now? You know, I'd, I'd call them on that one. I'd call the police <laughs> on that one. But Energy is saying that. Well, they're getting away with it. Yeah, they're getting away with it because people are letting them get away with it. Yes. Well... And unfortunately, we live in a, in, a, in, a, in a world where businesses like Entergy have got freedom of speech because they are people. Yep. They're persons, let me put it that way. And so they are allowed to My cat is exercise that, <laughs> they're allowed to exercise that freedom of speech any way they want, which yeah. means they can lie any way they want in order, to, and they can lobby any congressman they want, and they can spend any amount of money they want on advertising to tell things, anything they want in order to make as much money as they want. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. <laughs> My rant for the day, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Moving right along, we're okay. switch over to Australia now. Okay, Brisbane Times. The government of Australia Capital Territory is on track to reach its 90% renewable energy target by 2020, despite needing to quadruple its current supply in just four and a half years. The current figure of 18.6% is set to dramatically increase over the next two years with wind playing a dominant role. That's their equivalent of Washington, D.C. It sure is. The it's capital. Yeah, it's the, it's the, it, actually, Australian capital territory is the equivalent of the D.C. part of Washington, D.C. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, that, not that if you live in Washington, there's a lot of, there's a lot of distinction. Well, what they're saying here is wind will make up more than five times the amount of energy solar is expected to provide. Yeah. This is Australia. Yeah. Now, they've got a lot of wind. I mean, they've they got, got a lot, a lot of wind. Desert, wherever there's desert, there's wind. But their wind is almost all on the coast, believe it or not. Well, I don't believe it. <laughs> no, I've, I've, I looked at a map. Well, I'm not. Their, I'm really their big a, wind farms are almost yeah. all on the coast. Oh, Actually, the wind farms are. Yeah, but okay. the, the yeah, I'm sorry, I I was I was very inaccurate in what I said there. The wind farms are almost all on the coast, which is hardly a surprise because the cities that's are almost the population. Yeah, that's right. So um, anyway, so Monday. So that is Simon Corbell, in case you were wondering what he looked like. And oh, okay. He is the uh, environmental minister. Okay. Nation, nationwide environmental minister. Yeah. So he's an important guy. Yeah. Moving right along. Clean Technica told us on Monday, June 22nd, a little-known startup energy storage co company called UET just announced a major milestone for its latest flow battery project. The company's CEO says, quote, the Uni Systems levelized cost, which is the dollars per total GWH delivered over a 20-year lifetime. Levelized cost is an important consideration. It means basically the over average, the over, overall <laughs> average cost, is multiple times lower than the cost of lithium-ion systems such as that from Tesla. 
And I think, I wish I, that he had said, instead of multiple times lower, that it was a fraction of the cost. But um, in fact, the reason he's saying this, I think, is partly because he expects that the Tesla batteries are going to have to be replaced over a 20-year well, period. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They, got a, they got a known lifetime. Yep. Actually, they got two lifetimes. Yes. One lifetime as, as useful in powering a car. Yep. And then they have another lifetime useful as storage. For, yeah. So uh, we talked about it last week. Yep. General Motors? Right yes, there? that's right. General, General Motors. Motors. They were going to they were going to start recycling batteries onto the power grid, but in I this case, he's there. looking at that thing that looks yeah. like man. That looks like something out of some kind of <laughs> science fiction cartoon. Here's the Jetsons. We've talked about this before. Yeah, these, we have. These. This is an amazing thing. It's been around for a long time. Yep. And they had no use for it, basically. Yeah. There were other batteries or other storage devices did the job. They were cheaper. Yeah. But now we got a different. Need, yeah, and we got these things being resurrected, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people coming up with different variations of it. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful part of it is they don't wear out. They don't wear out. Aside from the kind of tacky colors, they don't wear out. Well, that's also <laughs> interesting because in this particular model, the electrolytes actually do change color as they trans. Wow, isn't that and amazing? That wasn't designed. That's just <laughs> is that what they that did. It just happens to be that way. Yeah. I, I think that was a design feature. They and should take credit for that. We're looking at it here, and the only part of this that is subject to wear and tear is the pumps. Yes, yes, that's right. Basically, yeah. they're pumping this electrolyte from point A to point B, running it through a magical black box. Mm -hmm. And if they run it through one way, they get power out. If they run it run it through, through the, the other way, way they get they have to put power back. Right, in. and. And, and these, they can keep doing that forever. Yeah, and these, you know, this is really a very interesting system, I think. It's an extremely... I think it's going to be very important in the grand scheme of things. I agree. I, I absolutely agree. The, I think anybody who's looking for a, looking for a, uh, a backup system for a, um, a, uh, a mini uh, microgrid... Rooftop solar or something. Well, for rooftop solar. You or know, microgrid? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know about this company, but uh, Imergy is selling systems that are scaled uh, to, to, to the size of what we would need for a household. And they're selling them it's all over be. the world. It's gotta be, you know? it makes sense. Yeah. yeah, we've seen some of the ones that yeah, they, they go, the size you know. of a small refrigerator. Yeah. They pop up a, a couple of solar panels off the roof and the village is ready to go. That's right. And not only that, but you know, you open the top up, put in a nickel, and you can have a can of soda. <laughs> I'm lying. Not for a nickel anymore. <laughs> no, not for a nickel. Yeah, not for a nickel, that's true. Okay. Um, this, this one we've sort of talked about before, too. Yes. Uh, public News Service, a report from the National Institute for Science, Law, and Public Policy says the proposed Hudson Valley Power Line project only serves utility companies and their suppliers. It says New York consumers gain more with locally generated renewable energy sources and better reliability without the lines. Well, this is something we've got to look at really close. Yeah. Because, number one, New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Connecticut, they are going to need continually more energy because there's more people. Yep. It's a densely populated part of America, rather the most densely part of so here we got this surplus of power up in Canada, the right. hydro power. Right. And we got a dearth down in down by the Long Island Sound. Right. How do we get it from here to there? Yes. Well, this this picture happens to show transmission lines, but basically they're gonna they're put gonna the picture it, up, Tom. Yeah, they're gonna run it under the under the uh, Champlain and the Hudson River. They're gonna be running cable. Right. But the the one point they make is the local people would be better off if it was distributed and they were making it. Well, I have absolutely no doubt that that is, the, that is the case. Furthermore, I think that it would be better if the distributed power facilities were locally owned because that way even the profits would stay in the I, local economy. I, I am in total agreement there. I yeah. think you know, co-ops and locally owned stuff. Municipalities, Municipalities, locally owned uh, uh, for-profit organizations, whatever it's going to be, it would be nice to see it be local, so that the money stays in the loca in 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 the location. Here's the I mean, takeaway from here: the technology and economy of electricity is in a rapid state of change right now. As those who watch this show know, 
<laughs> the economies of scale in the old system just don't work anymore. You could do it a lot cleaner and cheaper with distributed solar. Well, I say distributed energy. It's not all going to be it's solar. It's not all going to be solar. But yeah, it could be. Meanwhile, these guys need this energy. They know they need it in the near future. Yes. And renewables aren't moving fast enough yes. to fill the need. So Although renewables are going in at They're an astonishingly very, very fast speed. Faster than anybody would have predicted five years ago. Well, you know, there was a funny thing about that in the news today. Um, the EIA, and I've complained about the EIA's forecasts many times, but there was a thing in which there was a, a, a company that, an organization that raised the issue. Why, why are the EIA's predictions just incredibly bad? Because they predicted, I think it was five years ago. We've that, talked about this. Yeah. That solar power, wind power would be 60, 44 gigawatts and it's reached 66. They predicted that in 25 years it would be 44 gigawatts and it reached 66 in six years. And this is the organization that Congress is supposed to be basing its ideas about the future of energy on. Well, and what it's, I remember us talking about before, somehow or another their hands are tied. Their hands are tied yeah. by policy, yeah. yeah. Their hand, and they've, they've said so. Yeah. Um, anyway, there you have it. Um, our next item comes from Clean Technica. The sixth annual U.S. Clean Tech Leadership Index has been released. The index, prepared by Clean Edge, a research and indexing firm founded in the year 2000, tracks and ranks clean tech activities in all 50 states and the largest 50 metro areas in the U.S. This year, four states in the, New York, in the Northeast are in the top 10. And guess who is one of those? No, we're not one of them. We're in the we're top ten. Oh, we're in the, the top, top ten. 10. Oh, yeah, yeah. We are in the top ten. And uh, the, the article said top five. I wanted us to be in, so I made the top ten. <laughs> well, we're number six. We're number six in the nation. And, you know, Massachusetts is number two, which surprised Massachusetts has had a lot of stuff going. New York has had a lot of stuff going. Uh, there's just a lot of work going in the Northeast. Who is it? What was the other state that was in the top 10 that was aside from those three in the northeast was it connecticut, connecticut? Yeah. yeah but well, massachusetts look at that graph. vermont is on a roll we're climbing hawaii is yeah. on a roll connecticut's on a roll yep and yep. so the, the next time they publish this list it's going to look very different i think well you look at california at the top though though yeah. it's yeah, been yeah, at the yeah, top right on top right on top right on there top. it is and um that i think Considering that Cal California Senate has has passed its its uh, a bill to go to 50% renewables, I think they'll probably stay on the top. Okay. Well, let, let me give you a quick takeaway from this. Okay. This is from the article. The yep. transition to a clean tech and energy efficient based economy. The economy now, the whole ball of wax. Yeah. Based upon the many indicators we track, is well underway. Solar and wind power, along with natural gas and energy efficiency, are now the mainstream choices for meeting the nation's electricity needs. Coal-fired and nuclear power, the dominant choices of the 20th century, have become marginalized. Yes, they have. And natural gas isn't going to last long. Natural gas is not going to last long for a variety of reasons. And those we've talked about a number of times. Well, but I mean, nuclear is a hopeless case, and, and coal is worse than hopeless. It's, a, it's a, at this point turned into a pest that has to be got rid of. Um, our next item from LA Magazine says, a ma the mayor of Los Angeles announced that the city will sell its shares in the Navajo Generating Station, a coal-fired power plant based in Arizona. The sale is part of Garcetti's pledge to make L.A. coal-free by 2025. Yeah, he's the mayor, right? Yeah, I believe yeah. so. Instead I like of rel this picture. It looks like isn't a that giant something? Bird. You know what it looks like is a is a is a is a mushroom-shaped cloud. Yeah, that's true. yeah. <laughs> In, uh, instead of relying and that on that is the plant we're talking about. It is indeed that is the the Navajo plant. Um, instead of relying on coal-fired power, the city is turning to renewable geothermal power. That's interesting. I didn't know they had. Potential. They have a lot in, in Southern in California. Well, yeah. California, yeah, they they have it in California. Uh, yeah, the Southwest, they've got a lot. They don't have to go down very far. Well, geothermal is 
something we have not really been looking at very much in well, the way of renewables. Well, there are problems with geothermal, and one of them is that they actually, it actually alters the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, you, some years ago, I read about a plant that was being closed down because of um, because the, the the mountain that it was built on subsided, <laughs> and the well, reason why the mountain subsided they, was because the rocks had been contracting yeah, yeah. because they had been cooled off, and maybe they'll be able to open that plant again in the future. If that's the case, then what it means is there's a, an ideal rate at which you can extract um, geothermal energy. Well, there's different approaches or different sources of geothermal. Yes. In some cases, you got molten magma that's very hot. Like and Iceland. and in Iceland, they've actually they've actually put pipes directly yeah, into the it. magma to 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 get heat out of it. In California, they're doing it differently. The rocks are hot. Yeah. But they're pumping water down and pumping it back up. Right. Right. Putting them down there in the oven. Yep. Okay. Clean Technica told us also on Tuesday. A survey uh, by financial services from firm Wiser Capital indicates roughly two-thirds of large investment firms in the United States plan to prioritize solar energy over the next five years. Roughly 80% of those firms stated that their interest in solar energy was based at least partly on a desire, quote, to support a cleaner energy future, end quote. Well, I'm that's, sure that's interesting. Important. That's sure. interesting to me. But it's still, these are the investors. They are the investors. It's That's not right. The, not the tree huggers that are doing this. This is the money. This with is the investors. Money. The people with the money. The people with the money, I think, are starting. Well, you know, um, this is something that you, you can trace back in part to an organization like Ceres in Boston yeah. that's been going out and lobbying investors and saying, do, and, and companies. And one of their pitches is we can show you that your bottom line will improve if you run your company sustainably. And they've been able to show that yeah. to a bunch of big companies. Yeah. And the big companies are responding to this. They would be, they would be um, incompetent if they ignored the possibilities to improve their bottom line. And if, Absolutely. And if they, if, you know, if, the, if they did that because it's sustainable, then they'd just be silly. And I have to admit, I think some big companies are silly, but, you know, that's just my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I will mention one thing. What's that? We've been talking about this a lot. Yep. A lot of it's been coming from Bloomberg. Yes. I mean, they're really right on top of this. And yes. Bloomberg is, is Wall Street, I mean, for God's sake, you well, know. I think they're... They're not, they're not tree huggers. Oh, I think Bloomberg is a little bit of a tree hugger. I think so. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, whatever. Their their record and the state things that they've been saying are, is is in that direction. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. But you know, <laughs> um, okay. Utility dive gave us this item. Uh, presidential hopeful Martin O'Malley, the former governor of Maryland, has proposed an ambitious clean energy plan that would call for the United States to use all its renewable use all renewable resources by 2050. O'Malley tied his proposal to P Pope Francis' recent call to address climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Wow, well, that's I, a colorful it picture. It sort of makes sense. Yeah, it does. It sort of makes sense when we move on. Put the yeah, picture back. What is the picture? This is just a wind farm. Yeah, I know. I, I don't know. It's a blue it's and orange wind farm with a green stripe in the middle. <laughs> Look at that. Where did, how did like that happen? It's like wheat field or something down below. You know what it is? It's uh, canola. It's canola. Ah. It's, or it, it's mustard. They're all in the same family, but they have yellow flowers. Okay. And look sort of yellow. You know what it reminds me is, of is a wind farm in Holland. I saw a picture of a wind farm in Holland where the turbines are against a blue sky uh -huh. and, the, and the ground is covered with neat rows of different colored um, 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 tulips. Ooh. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> in the old days, it was windmills and tulips. Now it's it's wind turbines and tulips. I don't tulips. know where this wind farm is, but it's not mountainous country. No. So you were going to say, Tom? I'm sorry. I I I, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, okay. Should we should we should we go on to Lake Mead or continue? Well, with I, that? I guess I got a couple of things uh, highlighted here. Okay. So we're talking again about O'Malley, and he wants 100 percent renewable power for the United States within 35 years. Yeah, eminently doable, I think. I think that's doable. 
funding. Yeah, eminently doable. It's going to happen even before 35. Yeah, and I think that's... Just because I think, of the economics involved. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. Um, he's run for president, so he's saying all sorts of wonderful things. <laughs> On day one, I would reject projects like Keystone XL. Deny new per permits for drilling in Alaska, Antarctica, and off our coasts, and increase royalties and emissions fees for fossil fuel companies currently drilling on federal lands. Yeah, well, and yeah, they're getting the, they're take getting back the, the two hundred and twenty million dollars energy Investing got out of the proceeds in jobs and skills training. Well, it makes sense what he does. Yes, that. it does. It does indeed. I don't think he's a serious candidate. I mean, he's he's serious, but I don't think he's. Uh, Bernie will beat him. Bernie will beat him, yeah. I don't now, know. Honestly, I think Bernie will beat uh, Hillary. Well, it could very well happen. There's a lot of people who will not vote for Hillary under any circumstances, in <laughs> including me. Yeah, absolutely. If, I ha if I'm faced with Hillary or any one of the <laughs> Republicans, I'll write in Bernie. Yeah. I'm not going to vote for that woman. I don't trust her. And I think for good reason. Um, okay. Well, she's part of the uh, Bush, Bush crime family. <laughs> <laughs> That's an opinion, Tom. Admit it. Admit it. I'm not even sure it's an opinion. I think it's a joke. Okay, Wednesday, June 25th. Well, we're running to, to the end of the week now. We are, and we've got a beautiful picture of Lake Mead for everybody. I see that Tom two, has got two, two pictures of Lake Mead. This month, Lake Mead, the 112-mile reservoir created by the Hoover Dam, is projected to hit 1,074.73 feet above sea Why level. they call it 1,075? I don't know. <laughs> the lowest it has been since 1937 Which when it was... basically when they built it. Yeah, they built it in 1936, and in 37 it was just getting filled up. Thanks to a 16-year drought and, and serious over-allocation, Lake Mead is now just 37% full. This means higher electricity electricity costs for 29 million people. And the article goes into depth about uh, how they arrive at power at power pricing and stuff like that. Yeah. Edging their bets with uh, investments in futures, future prices. Yes. So if the price of cost of making electricity doubles, as this article suggests, they're not going to be paying electricity for that. They've got insurance. Ah. This, this this is an interesting takeaway, and they're talking about the energy cost to the producer. Right. Okay. With each 25-foot drop, and we're looking at their first 25-foot drop. Yeah. Energy costs increased by roughly 100%. They double. The cost of producing electricity doubles because there's not that much pressure yes. left in the system to run the turbines fast enough. Which means that you would have to use more water to get the same amount of electricity, even though the or reservoir... Or get less electricity. Yeah, it's kind of like the way banks charge people for, for interest. You know, if you can't afford it, they charge you more. And the cost paid by contractors for hydropower triple it at 1050 feet, quadruple at 1025 feet, and at 900 feet the turbines won't run at all. Yes. That, that height, by the way, 900 feet or whatever, is, is the height above sea level, not the height above the outlet. So, okay. so this, the, that's I the reason. Think about yeah, that. that's the reason why you say, well, if, if the thing is at 900 feet, it won't run. And it would be very easy for a person to think 900 feet is a lot of head. But it's yeah, not. But it's not head at 900 feet because the base of the dam is way above sea level. Feet. Yeah, probably. Yep. So they oh. call this a dead pool. And they're. A, a dead pool. A dead pool. Well, Still ways off. Maybe they should put trout in it and use it for fishing. <laughs> oh, there's plenty of good fishing in Lake Mead. Is there? Oh, yeah. Oh, isn't that nice? It's, it's not a drinking water reservoir. You can go out there and fish and camp. And, uh, oh, really? Oh, yeah. If you can get past the bathtub ring. Well, we've, we've talked <laughs> about that. We've seen, we've seen pictures of yeah. marinas that are now, now are on dry land. Yeah, okay. All right, from the Voice of America, this is an interesting item to come from the Voice of America. The impact of climate change is so great that it could undermine the last 50 years of gains in global health. That is the assessment of a new report from the Lancet Commission on Health and Climate, an independent international multidisciplinary research group. Similar findings have come from the U.S. EPA. Now, this is the Voice of America, but they're talking globally here. Yes, they are. 
And that is a serious problem. They're saying, okay, we could, we, we, we gain and we lose. And climate change is a loss. And if you've got, you know, if you live in Vermont and you got Lyme disease in Ver Vermont, you, pro you might have got infected by something you would not ever have got except for climate change. So yeah, because the, the ticks weren't up here. The ticks weren't up here. So maybe the thing to do would be to have a class action suit against Coke Industries. <laughs> yeah. It's not a bad idea. I don't know if it would work, but, yeah. you know, they've got money. Well, this picture the people who have China Lyme disease Asia, don't. Not China. And uh, they're wearing masks to, to protect against the smog there. This and is we've where? We've seen some pictures of China. It's oh, Indonesia. yeah. Indonesia. We've seen some pictures of China where everybody's wearing masks. Yeah. You and can't even see through the air. And the, and the uh, situation in India is worse yet. Yes, indeed. Okay. And our final item for today is from Live Mint. And I don't know why it is. My eyes treat, play, play tricks on me. That is L-I-V-E-M-I-N-T. Well, and when I, when, I look at the, when I look at that, somehow <laughs> my eyes resolve that into liver nint. <laughs> but, well, I'll tell you what life mint is. It's the Indian equivalent of the Wall Street Journal. Okay. So it's a significant publication. Well, I'm thank, thankful to you, Tom, for your yeah, world-traveling background. I know you've been in India. I've never been in India. Yeah, I have seen the Taj Mahal. And, uh, wow. <laughs> seen Bombay. Haven't seen a lot of India, but I've been there more than once. I'll tell you one thing I did that you never did. What? I climbed, um, I climbed the main tower at Canterbury Cathedral, and went oh, out yeah. went out into ring one. Bell, ring the bells? I don't know, but it's no, it's not bells there. Um, but I went out on the way down. I sneaked off on a catwalk and went to a went to a um, storm gutter, a rain gutter, which was about uh, chest deep and wide enough that I could stand in it comfortably. And I touched a, a gargoyle. I'm the only person I know, aside from my brother who is with me, who's actually touched a gargoyle. I, don't think I, touched a gargoyle. <laughs> I know I have never touched a gargoyle. I was being a very <laughs> naughty boy. Okay, the renewable energy boom is here. Trillions of dollars will be invested over the next 25 years, driving some of the most profound changes yet in how humans get their electricity. That view is according to a new forecast by Bloomberg. New energy finance that plots our global power markets to 2040. You know, this is something that I think a lot of people who complain about renewable power absolutely miss, <laughs> is, the, is the underlying economics because they just don't get it. There is a huge area out, uh, out there for, uh, for investment. And, and what is mitigating against it right now, and this, it is supporting a large part of the Congress of the United States in opposition to renewable power and so forth, but they are, uh, that is happening because this new investment is going to be in competition with old investment. Exactly. The people who have already invested their money don't want their assets to be stranded. And they would love to tell you that they're patriots, pro-American, pro-democracy, and in fact, everything that they're doing is, is bad for America, bad for democracy, and but good, for them. good for them in the short term. But the newer investors don't care about the old investors. Yes, and <laughs> the, old investments, the old investors are just getting older. Um, this article had six takeaways from it. Okay. Six, six massive shifts coming to the power markets, coming soon to power markets near you. Okay. It's happening already. Okay. Solar prices keep crashing. Yes, they keep doing that. It's really impressive. <laughs> and as a corollary to that, solar billions will become solar trillions. Yes. So the investors are looking at this as a way to make money. Yes. Obviously. That's an interesting thing to see investors look at a market because the prices on the market are declining rapidly. And a corollary to that, we didn't, it's not in this article, but we talked about it last week. It's in, was it San Antonio? I don't know. Where they're putting in a bunch of renewable energy and they specified that the money, is it, where the money's coming from specifies that everything has to be made in San Antonio? Oh yes, it does. Yeah. Why not? Why not? You know, okay. Tom, we are at the end of our time. 
Believe it or not, we are at the end of our we time. We certainly are. We tried so. this one. We tried this one. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to say goodbye. And um, I want to invite everybody back next week. And I can't tell you how much we enjoy um, giving you this propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Goodbye. Have everybody. a good week. I want to point out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still.